Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. Welcome to Life Support. We're so glad to have you with us. What we do on this show is we tell stories, and some of the stories are hard to tell because they deal with suffering, they deal with trauma, but the idea is to introduce Jesus into the equation and really understand how he is redemptive and how you can live your life with joy, knowing that Christ is with you. And my guest again today, we uh, talked about this last time, but we're going to talk about it some more. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Harms is with us. She's written a book called, Are You Ready? How to Build a Legacy to Die For? And welcome back. It's so good to have you again. It's good to be back. We talked about the book uh, some last time. We talked about your personal story, which is a hard story. You've lost family members to suicide. You lost your husband not that long ago. Uh, to uh, an illness, and then you wrote this book, and it talks about legacy. And well, we as Christians don't talk about legacy very often. We we want to talk about getting people saved and all that, which is great. What do you mean by legacy? <laughs> well, your legacy is what you leave with every encounter you have with every person, and we. You know, our, the best legacy, of course, because God tells us our purpose in life is to glorify him. Of course, the best legacy you can leave is to help people come to Christ. And many times you can do that by your example as well. And so when I talk about legacy, I talk about what you're leaving behind. What are you leaving with your encounters with people? And uh, I'm a grandmother. I have, I have six grandchildren. And I really wanted to really sit down and seriously look at what legacy am I leaving to my grandchildren? Yeah, and there you've got several different kinds of legacies here uh, described in the book. I remember uh, when I was living in Arizona, and uh, we one of the men that went to our church was uh, uh, oversaw the Air Force Base there, and he got a brain tumor. So his wife would enlist people from the church to come and sit with them and read scripture to him and so forth. And it was an honor to do that. And uh, one day he looked at me and he said, hey, Paul, like, um, I'm asking different men to help me with my legacy. I said, okay. And he said, would you do something for me? And of course, you know, well, of course, you know, w- w- yeah, sure. What, what do you want? What do you need? He said, I want you this year to pray about leading one man to Christ and discipling him to maturity in Christ. That's what, I, that's what I'm asking all the men around me to do. That's how you leave a legacy, right? Mm-hmm. And so how, what are the legacies that you describe in your book? And what, are, are, what, are import, what is important to you? Well, when the book is dedicated really to the legacy that I received from my mother, my son, and my husband. Now, my mother was bipolar. She was mentally ill. But she she led me to God. She told me to trust in God in all things. She left the greatest legacy ever. And she left a big legacy of love to me. My son left similar legacies to me and to his uh, classmates. He was a student at Columbia University. And uh, they did a memorial service for them. And they actually have a a, a memorial to him, a memorial shad bush. It's permanent uh, there. Uh, And they talked about how he would He was the guy that would hug everybody. He was all around campus. He was this happy guy, and he was a Christian guy. And my my husband left a legacy to me after 44 years of marriage of love and support, and I I became who I am because I had that love and support for so many years. So the book is really based upon their legacy to me as I'm trying to then transfer my legacy uh, to to others. I had probably one of the um, just an amazing situation in my life where I've come across some amazing people and God just put them in my lives my life one of those times was right after my son Eric died I uh, and anybody that has lost a child and you know how that is especially to circumstances like murder or suicide yeah that complicates things and then of course I had my mother's death that I was also grieving altogether I was in a very 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 bad place and I was crying out to God every day to just come and save me from the pit. And I started to run into people from Rwanda. Now, Rwanda, as you know, had a terrible genocide in 1994, where uh, one part of the population was trying to wipe out the other, the Hutus, and were trying to wipe out the Tutsis, and, and it was a horrific 
situation of of just uh, murder. You weren't. It wasn't a, an invading army coming in. It was it was your next door neighbor and the people mm. that you, you spent some of your life with, people you thought you were friends, and it was just this horrific, horrific, unbelievable situation that occurred in 1994. When that happened, I was raising my children, and I listened to it. I was horrified, as was the rest of the world, but I didn't really think much about it later. But here I am after Eric died. I sat at a prayer breakfast next to a woman who had lost her two children in the genocide and her husband. And she she was telling me the story, and I was just horrified. But then she said, well, now I have a new husband, and I've adopted new children. She took in in orphans after the, the genocide. And now I'm living a new life according to God's will. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm mourning the loss of one child. How in the world could this woman survive the loss of her whole family? Then a couple of days later, someone gave me the book Left to Tell by Immaculate Ely Begazi. It's a story about uh, she was saved by a pastor in a bathroom with eight other women as the murderers were running around her. Amazing story. And then a few weeks later, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who was on the board of Books for Africa. And she said, you know, I visited Rwanda before the genocide, and I've always wanted to build a library there. Let's let's build one uh, as a memorial to Eric. And I thought, oh, yes, that would be wonderful. And I just kept, God just kept putting Rwanda, Rwanda, Rwanda on my heart. And before I knew it, about a year later, we went there to deliver seven libraries. And I found a people who had survived the most horrific thing we could even imagine. Uh, the entire families wiped out. Uh, women, some women had survived but were raped and given AIDS, kind of as part of the that's part of the warfare. Uh, some of them had children by the rapist who had given them AIDS, and I, and just each of these people going more down into the depths of what I think would be horror than I could imagine. Yet, they were joyful. They were dancing. They were singing, and they embraced me as someone who had lost a child. I was like one of the bunch right away. Mm-hmm. They showed me so much love, and I realized that. That love is the greatest legacy we could ever leave, and, and they were the experts in that. And that's kind of probably the beginning of uh, my thinking about legacy with these libraries. We now have 65 libraries all over the country. Oh, good for you. 50,000 books. So. But, um, you know, we can all leave a legacy, even those that are mentally ill, you know, even those that are, die at 19. Uh, we can leave a legacy of love because Christ gave us that ability. Reminds me of the apostles. Uh, when they're talking about, hey, we're you know we're feeling honored to be beaten, you know we we feel fortunate to be the ones who are giving ourselves for the gospel, but how do you um, how do you differentiate between good grief, let's let's call it that for lack of a better term, that is going to be there whether you want it to be or not, you don't want to just shove it off, you want to deal with it, right? And grief then that becomes um, what you don't want to have. How do you differentiate? Because I have a hard time doing that. Mm-hmm. Because I don't want to just bury the grief. At the same time, I don't want it to uh, be a part of my life every minute of every day. Well, as you know, when you are in the, I, I call it the grief pit because that's the best way for me to describe it. It's and a good I've term. Been, yeah. And I've been down, you're in the depths, you know, you can hardly, you get, you're in the mud, you maybe have one nostril, you know, surviving. You could hardly breathe. And and there was a while uh, where I lived there almost comfortably. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, you know, I kind of ordered curtains for the windows that were non-existent. I mean, I was there. I was kind of living there. And it was several times in my life I've been there. I do suffer from depression. I am treated for that. And I, I realized that I was missing out on providing the love that God had shown me to the others in my life because it's really hard to show love when you're way down in the pit. It's hard to do that. You can do it, certainly, but it's hard to show love and also the joy of the Lord. How do I find the joy of the Lord? That seemed like a, that would seem like a crazy verse to me. The joy of the Lord yeah. is your strength. I'm like, right. what, what the heck is joy? I'll never yeah. have joy in my life again. Right. But for me, I because I wanted to be there for my children and because I wanted to be there for my husband, I literally crawled and fought and did every possible thing I could to help me get out of the pit. I also focused on Satan. The first time in my life, I didn't really think about Satan much throughout my life, but I, in this pit, I thought, you know, he wants me here. Mm-hmm. And I think 
I could turn, interestingly enough, that anger mm -hmm. against him wanting me here and also the role he played in the death of my son and my mother, I think, um, helped me to just get that energy to fight and fight and fight and fight. Now, I have to tell you, for my son, it took about 10 years to really get out of there. Now, and I also think I kind of try to fake it till you make it because you don't want everyone to suffer with you. So there were times when sure. even though I was not feeling so well, I would smile and put on a good face that people would thought I was Oh, we're happy. all but, good at that. Yeah, the faking it thing. But I, yeah. think, I think it's sometimes I think that's a, a good thing in a way in that you spare other people from suffering yes. the grief. So yes. it's, it's you don't want to bury it. Yeah. But you also don't want everyone else to suffer with you. So for me, it was an intense 10 year journey of just, and, and at the same time, my husband was sick and he kept almost dying for about 13 years. So he would go from one horrible event to another, and there, there were at least so 10. So you times. were a caretaker along with yes. having to deal with all this yes. other grief that was going on. Yes. And Jim kept coming out of it. You know, he kept miraculously surviving. We say he had like 18 lives. We tried to start counting them. Um, so I was dealing with that as well, and then trying to just find my identity in Christ. What is my identity? Who am I? You know, I'm a, I was a mother. Well, I'm not a mother anymore. And by the way, right after Jim, right after Eric died a year later, I lost my ability to practice dentistry. I was a dentist, and I, I had a nerve damage in my drilling fingers. All of a sudden, I couldn't practice anymore. So I lost my identity as a mother. I lost my identity. Uh, my professional identity, and by the way, I was supposed to support the family because Jim was sick, so he was, he was also a dentist, so I was like, whoa, yeah. now, you know, so I lost that yeah. identity, and and my identity at that time was as a caretaker mostly, and, um, and then when Jim died, I lost that identity, so it's kind of reshaping your identity in Christ. Who are we in Christ? And I, I was just able, for a very long time, of heavy reading in the gospel um, and getting treated for depression, because I do have that, just helped me to find my way out. And, I, and after about 10 years after Eric died, the shroud that you have when you're grieving, yeah. you just have the shroud that no matter where you are, you're walking yes. around with this big shroud over you and you mm -hmm. can't see the world clearly because mm -hmm. it's all, it's clouded. Yep. I saw that lifted. Having grandchildren helped, I will say that. Yes. I saw that mm -hmm. lifted so I could actually see them and really be 100% there not all the time. I mean, anniversaries would come, and then you'd go back down to the pit to a certain degree. Yeah, there's but, a good old anniversaries and birthdays right. and Facebook reminders and all that fun yes. stuff. Yeah, so I would yeah. get I would get hit by that occasionally. Yep. But most of the time, I could look clearly without the shroud and be joyful in the Lord and share that with my children. Yeah. And then Jim died. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then I went through it again, but not probably as deep because we had anticipated his death so many times. Eric's was just such a shock. My life was yeah, going one well, way and damn, like, just like with your son. That's right? horrific to have right. to deal with that. Yeah. Right. But Jim, I had been preparing for mm -hmm. 13 years. Um, so I went back into the pit, but not as deeply. And I, I knew where to look. I knew where to turn, and it was to God. And I've been just trying to focus on that and try to understand what does he want me to do. And he has our purpose pretty clear. And the purpose for me is the same as for everybody else. It's like, you don't, it doesn't matter what you're, I had a really good resume as a dentist. I was a f first woman president of the Minnesota Dental Association. I was a national spokesperson. I had some really big titles, you know, that, that, that people would look up to. That, that, that really doesn't mean much of anything. Yeah. My identity is through God. And what does he want me to do? He wants me to love God, first commandment, love people. And then thirdly, to glorify, you know, most importantly, to glorify him, actually. Right. So if I try to do that and do that the best I can, I, I will meet my ultimate goal of, when, of going to heaven and having God give me a high five and saying, good job. Kid. Right, right. So, and trying to get all that in your head. I mean, we can have it in our head, but we have yeah. to get it into our heart. And that's a hard yeah. transition. But I do have it in my heart now, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Did you feel guilty for feeling joy? Yes. Yes, that was that. that That's that, a hard one to it's overcome. A real hard one. It was mm -hmm. a hard one. And, and and when you first go through this, you walk out of the door of the hospital or wherever you're at, mm -hmm. and and you see everyone living their lives and having fun. You know, buying groceries. Yeah, it's like in a different games. world, isn't it? It's a wholly different world, and yeah. you just want to scream at everyone. Yeah. How can you be yeah, happy? My that's son right. is dead. My husband's yeah. dead. How can you possibly live like this? Mm -hmm. And again, it's been thirteen. It's been fifteen years actually since Eric has died and three years since my husband died. And I, I, I'm i learning that I can enjoy Christmas with my with my children. 
Wow. We talk about Jim. In fact, yep. I, I still, uh, when I give gifts, I give them from Nana and Pop Pop. I give them for both of us. So we honor Jim. We talk about Jim. And we talk about Eric. And my grandchildren know what happened to Eric, their Uncle Eric. Um, and I do have moments where I slide. Mm-hmm. But the, the amazing thing, the, the, be, the most important accomplishment I've ever accomplished in my life was to really try to find my identity in Christ and try to get the joy of the Lord that passes, and the peace that passes all understanding, because it doesn't, it's hard to understand. How can you understand that, that's peace? That's right. That's right. Peace. Of, and I was taught a lot of that yep. by looking at the people in Rwanda who have overcome things. What far a wonderful, more than we can do. yeah, what a wonderful picture that is of, of people that have overcome that. And I would implore people if, if, if you're in a place right now and you're doing fine, please invest in your faith. Please learn about God. Please spend time with God because when suffering strikes, what I found was um, I was able to do things and and say things that I didn't really have the human capacity to do. And I remember um, on these occasions, all of the theology that I'd learned, all the things, all, many scriptures that I had forgotten that I knew, kind of what floated to the surface. And I attribute that to wh- how I knew God before it all happened. Mm-hmm. And I fear that there are many who are coasting and then something's going to hit hard and they're going to say, well, I, I don't know this God that would let this happen. So please don't take your faith for granted. And I, I'm sure you felt the same way because... Mm-hmm. These things that you're talking about, the, the things that I've experienced, the things that people in Rwanda experience, and everybody experiences something, mm-hmm. yes, um, are are life changing. And I I find that even though I I'm not in that pit now, um, and like you, you know, sometimes it comes up. If I start to go into the pit, I just call a counselor mm-hmm. and I say I need to see you for a while. And but I also know that I'm not the same person. Yes. And I've come to grips with the fact that that's a good thing because that's part of God's process, right? Mm-hmm. So yes. how do you, how, how have you experienced that? I am not at all the person that I was before. And but I'm a person that understands my ident- my true identity. I'm mm-hmm. not like the president or this or that. I mean, I'm not th- that stuff is worldly. The worldly the worldly definition of me is very different than the godly definition of being. Yeah, you don't need that stuff anymore, right? I don't need that stuff yeah. anymore. And But mm-hmm. I'm realizing one of the reasons I wrote the book, as we enter uh, the um, the fourth quarter of our lives, as some people call us instead of uh, uh, millennials, we're perennials, we're still here. Yeah. Um, as we enter that, we, you know, our identity changes because, you know, I just had a hip replaced. I've got, I'm, I'm not as, I'm independent, but, you know, I my children take care of me now and then when I need to have an operation or something. Um, I'm facing all these things as we get older, and we're more vulnerable. The scammers are calling us. You know, we have how many phone calls do you get from scammers every day on your phone? We are a vulnerable population, yeah. Uh, and we we need to really turn to Christ more than ever to get our identity in Him and to realize that we still have the capacity, no matter what we're, you know, how sick we are, no matter what we're doing, we have the capacity to fulfill God's will for us, which is to love God, love people, and glorify Him. We can do that no matter what. And if we realize that that's our main focus of our lives, it's so much easier to have that joy, to get that joy of the Lord. And, and Satan peace. wants to sideline you. Oh, he does. He yeah. really does. Yeah. And fight him. I mean, just yeah. get any energy you have, the, the negative energy you have, just use to fight him off. Right. Because right. he's going to do whatever he can to, to push you right down in that pit because you're not as useful to God in that pit. The spiritual war is very real. It's very real. And he understands, you know, Satan's a good observer. Mm-hmm. And so he and his uh, his friends, his demons, they can tell when you're struggling. They can, they can tell when you're sliding into that pit. They can tell when you're arrogantly thinking that I can get through this on my own without God. And they will pounce, right? Yes, they will. Um, so, you, so I think it's what you're saying is really important. And I, I think what you're touching on in the book that we didn't get a chance to really talk about today is all the different legacies you can leave. I, I would highly recommend that. Um, and and um, how you can prepare others for your own death, yes. which is massively important in a culture where we don't like to even 
say the word someone's died. We yes. say they've passed. Yes. We've lost. Yes. And we don't want to go anywhere near them in the in the funeral home because that would be too close to death. But in other cultures, they're carrying them around, and and it's just a whole different thing. So anyway, the book is, Are You Ready? How to Build a Legacy to Die For. Where can you get the book? You can get the book at Barnes & Noble or .com or Amazon.com, and you just type in, Are You Ready? How to Build a Legacy to Die For, and it'll pop right up. Is there another book in the offing at some point? Well, actually, I'm, I did write a widow's book, uh, Naomi and the Widow's Club, which is a, a, a one-year devotional uh, weekly devotional for widows, and I'm now right now I'm writing a workbook to go along with that. We're we're working with a, a publisher to do a video series. It will kind of go alongside maybe after you've done grief share, and you, and you would like something that's a, um, to help you a little bit longer. Yeah, we're doing one of those too. So I'm working. Good on that for now. you. Good for you. That's all really really helpful. I'm so glad you joined us. Thanks for being here. Thank you and it's sharing your story.